Hey there, I've been really excited about posting the next couple of chapters and Waiting for Normal. <clears throat> and in case you have not been following, um, my students and I have been reading this book um, for a while and we wanted to finish it. And since we've been quarantined, we can't go to school. So um, I did a couple segments. We did chapters 37 through 39 and then chapters 40 through 42 and so we're up to chapter 43 <clears throat> and just as a quick overview this is a super book written by leslie connor and one of the cool things about this book is that um it's very real and um we got into it and really started enjoying it and then we couldn't finish it and the title waiting for normal I think is pretty um, <clears throat> ironic when you think about what normal is because up until now um, you know we all thought we were waiting for normal and now with this um, coronavirus COVID-19 um, quarantine I think we appreciate what we once thought was what we were waiting on for normal and now <clears throat> we had no idea what we were taking for granted so one of the things that I've really um, gotten out of this experience first of all is I truly appreciate everybody who's out there on the front lines keeping us going grocery store workers our, our mail carriers our health care workers um, I mean, I know I'm forgetting people, factory workers, just so many people, truck drivers who <clears throat> continue to store workers, you know, gas station employees. There's so many people who continue to provide services for all of us. And um, even though I can't teach my students, I have the um, privilege of trying to teach them remotely and stay in and stay safe and try to stop the spread of this virus. And so... We're doing all we can, and we just thank you all who are um, keeping us going and providing the things that we need. Just want to give that shout out because it's important to appreciate those who do for us. Um, so back to our book. Again, um, this last chapter that we read was my fault, and um, something pretty extreme and dramatic happened to Addie as she was um, trying to take care of herself as usual and she was trying to cook for herself I'm trying to get my brain back into it myself and she left um, what was she cooking I forgot she got up she's gonna cook herself some wreck oh some hot cocoa sorry and it was the last packet and she got the water going and she didn't realize it was that close to the um, the fry pan that had the grease in it that her mom was supposed to clean out and, and Addie got kind of um, stubborn about cleaning it because Mommer said she would help clean it up and um, Addie decided to leave it for Mommer so when she came back she would clean it and what happened was it started a kitchen fire and <clears throat> Addie could not get it put out, so she grabbed Pick and got out of there, and Sula came to help rescue her, and we know the story with Sula and um, how she's very weak because she's been fighting cancer and going through chemo treatments, but she managed to help Addie get out of the trailer with Pick, and in case you aren't up to speed, Piccolo is Addie's um, pet hamster, and Sula is her neighbor. So the chapter 43 that we're about to, to get into is entitled A Hero in the Fog. And so there's a lot of heroes that we could think about here. Um, it could have been one of the firemen. It could be Sula who went over and helped Addie. It could be Addie herself because Addie um, made it a point to go back and tell the firefighters that the electricity was hooked up to the laundromat next door and she didn't want another building to get caught to get caught on fire to catch on fire and so she told the firemen and that really prevented a further um, tragedy so it could be that Addie is our hero it could be that there's somebody that we don't know about who is considered our hero here so maybe we're gonna find out as we read okay so think about making a prediction about that and um, let's get into it 
Elliot arrived and immediately handed out coffees to the firemen. Now remember, Elliot is Sula's um, probably best friend, and he works in the store with her and helps to take care of her through her treatments. Um, so he's come in to bring out some coffee to share with the firemen. He moved Sula and Piccolo inside. Me, I felt stuck. Everyone tried to get me to go in. They said I shouldn't be out there in my bathrobe with bare feet and bare legs. Plus, I was bare underneath that robe too, but I really couldn't feel anything. I watched the fire guys tie and haul the smoking black carcass of the trailer farther away from the heads and roses. Elliot brought me a pair of Sula slippers, one of the hose six guys, put a heavy rubber coat over me, and, and a paramedic asked me to hold some ice between my hands just for a little while. I wonder what she thinks that means. I wonder why she would have to hold some ice between her hands. I wish I could hear your really good responses because I'm sure you're telling me things like she probably burned her fingers while she was trying to, you know, put out the fire or save Piccolo or um, I remember her touching something hot. I thought I was going to sink into the ground. Mr. and Mrs. Rose arrived to check on the laundromat. Their plaid pajama legs stuck out below their winter coats. They cupped their hands over their noses as they looked at the charred remains of the trailer. The stink <clears throat> couldn't, could have, <clears throat> excuse me, could have made the vomit rise in the toughest of stomachs. The early customers who were always at the corner in the morning stopped to eye the scene. A few cars pulled into the Mini Mart lot. Only a lady arrived in a gray car and sat there, talking on her cell phone with a clipboard across her steering wheel. She looked up at me every once in a while, but never at the dead trailer. That's odd. Can't you see there was a fire, I thought, I sighed into the raining sky. Minutes later, poor Addie, I bet she's just got the weight of the world on her shoulders. Minutes later, Grandio pulled up in his white car and stopped with his tires right next to my toes. Addie, girl, you okay? He shielded his brow from the rain. I nodded. How did you know? Who called you? I said. I nodded. I called him. The lady from the gray car stepped up next to us. Addie, I'm Mrs. Casey. I'm from the Department of Youth and Family Services. Wow, I'm thinking maybe... Um, maybe this woman's found out that Addie, the 12 year old girl has been raising herself. <clears throat> I whirled and looked into the mini mart. Sula was seated in her chair at the front window. She caught my eye, then looked down into her lap. Maybe it was Sula who called the lady from the Department of Youth and Family Services. Maybe Sula's had enough of watching Addie all by herself. She can't do any more for her. I mean, Sula's tried, I think, to be the best friend she can be for her. Addie, Mrs. Casey spoke again. How long has your mother been away? I knew Sula had ratted me out. She knew Mommers had been gone too much, and now the state knew too, and I had a Mrs. Casey on my case. Forever, I said. She's been away forever. I turned toward Grandio and sighed. I knew I'd be going home with my next of kin. And now we're back to a break in the page. And we talked about how that's an indicator that time is passing here. Can you keep pick for a while? I set the cage next to Sula. Grandio will put up a fuss and he's already upset. I gazed out the window. Of course I will, Cookie. You know I will. Sula started to cry. She fiddled with the bent section of Pick's cage, tried to pop it back out again. I'm sorry about, she glanced toward Mrs. Casey's car. I couldn't see what else to do, Cookie. Truth is, I should have called them long ago. I know, I mumbled. <clears throat> I should have hugged her, should have told her everything was okay. Instead, I said, thanks for taking Piccolo. I'll see you soon. I ran out the door and got into Grandio's car. I sat waiting for him while he talked to the fire guys. My hands still hurt from the heat or ice. I wasn't sure. I could smell smoke in my wet hair. My damp bathrobe started to feel cold on my skin, and my insides were slush. Poor Sula. It wasn't enough she was sick. I'd put her in a bad position all those months. Now she felt terrible, and I felt terrible. 
I think it makes me sad that Addie carries the burden of all this on her shoulders and it's not her fault at all. <clears throat> I wish she could see that and feel peace knowing that it's actually a really good thing that Sula and Grandio have these <clears throat> concerns and they want to step in and help. I think Addie's very mature in her thinking. Finally, Grandio got into the car. Japers, girl, we're all fogged up. Why didn't you turn up the blower, he said. I think he's talking about the um, the defrost, maybe. Um, the windows are fogged up. He cleared the windshield with his hand and put the car in gear. We rolled slowly forward. I turned to look back at the mini mart. The clouded window made it hard to see, but I could tell that Sula was at the glass door hugging Piccolo's cage and watching me go. I concentrated hard as I drew four big letters in the fog on my window. I was careful to reverse them. H-E-R-O. I hope that Sula could see. Now that spells hero. Why do you think Addie would write with her fingers? hero in her fogged up window and hope that Sula would see. What do you think Addie's saying? I think she's calling Sula her hero because really Addie wanted to be rescued from the situation even though she's just been trying to protect her mom for so long. I think she's a little bit relieved to have somebody like Sula and now Grandio helping her. Chapter 44 after the fire. Dwight, I cleared my throat and waited. Grandio stood nearby waiting to take the phone. Addie, is that you? Yes, yeah, sorry to call so early. I said Grandio gave me a nudge. So if you give somebody a nudge, it's kind of like, you can do it. You know, I think Grandio is trying to get Addie to make this phone call, even though um, Addie seems to be a little bit reluctant or a little bit hesitant to call Dwight. You know, and I guess I can understand that. She's got some pretty big news to share with him, right? Everything all right? Dwight, I burned down your trailer, he said. Sweet, screaming, jeez, you all right? Fine, I said. Denise okay? She wasn't there. Grandio huffed and mumbled. Not there. All right. I covered my ear, tried to block him out. Wow, so what happened, Dwight said. It was stupid. I'm really sorry. I was being stubborn. There was a pan on the stove, and I... Grandio took the phone. Dwight, this is Jack here. Yeah, they say. He told Dwight everything while I sat at the old farm table in my soggy bathrobe. Eventually, I turned... I tuned out. I picked through a shopping bag of stuff Mrs. Casey had given me. She had come to the fire prepared. There was a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, and a pair of jeans a three-pack of underpants, some socks, and a sports bra. I thought about some of the things that were gone now, lost in the burned trailer forever. A bank card, melted now, an electric blue duffel, incinerated. A vocabulary book, probably in ashes. Addie, Grandio held the phone out to me. Dwight wants you back. Wants me back? Oh, I took the phone. Addie, I just want to make sure you know the trailer means nothing. Nothing at all. All I care about is that you're okay. You got it? Got it. I choked. Okay, we'll be down t later tonight, all of us. I set down the phone. I wonder if Addie really thought Dwight would be that upset about the trailer being burned. Well, girl, Grandio said, better go get yourself warmed up in the shower. Right, I said. My second one today. And now here's another break in the page. So I'm thinking some time has elapsed since she's taken her shower. That night, everyone seemed to be in such good moods. Grandia was enjoying having a crowd to cook dinner for. Besides, he was mush in Hannah's presence, and she was helping him in the kitchen. I think Grandio likes Hannah. The littles climbed all over me. They asked about the fire and kind of inspected me as if there should be something visibly different about me after what had happened. Dwight was making jokes. I don't care about the trailer, he said, but you could have invited us over if you were going to have a bonfire. We could have roasted wieners and marshmallows, kid. The laughter made me relax. Soon the whole crazy day started to slip away like an old skin. 
and all I felt was tired. I sank into the couch. Dwight would hardly leave my side, and I found myself leaning sleepily toward him, going for his arm again, the way I always used to. Sorry, I said. Riding myself on the couch beside him, he pulled me back over without a word and sat twirling a strand of my hair in his finger until they had to leave. So that's the end of chapter 44, and the next chapter is entitled Something Familiar. I wonder what that could be. So Addie's lost pretty much all of her things, you know, the things that were familiar to her, her little bunk and all of her clothes and um, her vocabulary book and even Pic Piccolo. And um, it makes me kind of sad that Piccolo can't be there with her. Maybe maybe that'll change. I'm hoping that Piccolo will maybe get to move in with her in Grandio or something like that. So there's something familiar about Chapter 45 because that's the title. So maybe... Um, maybe you can read the first line there and see what you think. I think it starts with Helena. Do you all remember who Helena is? She is Addie's good friend from school. And it says Helena and her mom drove a big box of secondhand clothes out to Grandio's farm three days after the fire. So perhaps that's the something familiar that she's talking about. Now, I thought about stopping here. This is a pretty short chapter. Maybe I'll read one more. I'll go ahead and read this one, and um, then we'll stop. Because I'm trying to keep these videos at about 20 minutes or so. Um, so, something familiar. Let's see what it is. Helena and her mom drove a big box of secondhand clothes out to Grandio's farm three days after the fire. The room, mothers, the room, mothers. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. The room mothers from my old school had taken up a collection. I didn't really know what room mothers were, but I think it has to do with like, you know, like on um, ball teams, sometimes you have a team mom. So I think this is kind of like a classroom, a group of classroom moms. It says the room mom, so maybe her classroom. All of her friends' moms from her old school had taken up a collection. I say old school because now that I was living at Grandios, I was being re-enrolled at Borden School again. My old school had become my new school and vice versa. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier when Addie used to say her life had a lot of twists and turns, and I think it's continuing to twist and turn, don't you? Some of the some of the stuff in the box is kind of lame, Helena whispered as she leaned toward me, but some of it's good. Robert's older sister sent some things. She gets good stuff, and I think it'll fit you. I had about four minutes to show Helena around the farm. Her mother stood on the front step with Grandio, but they were shuffling their feet the whole time, like people trying to think of something to say. I didn't have too much hope of seeing Helena again, but we both pretended that we would. Meanwhile, I, I heard just bits and pieces about mommers. I was pretty sure Mrs. Casey had figured me for a liar when I said I didn't know where Mommers was staying, but it was the truth. Heck, I didn't even know Pete's last name, but somehow they found her. Grandio told me that. He explained that she was not permitted to visit me just yet, and I think she might have even been taken to jail, at least for a while. I didn't ask. I knew that courts and agencies would make all the decisions. Mrs. Casey would come around when she had questions for me. After supper that night, I talked to Grandio. I really miss Piccolo, I said, and um, I really think it's too much to ask Sula to keep on taking care of a pet when she isn't so well, you know? He looked up from his paper. He had a habit of reading at the table. Where are we going to put a mouse? Hamster, I said. I got up from the table and set my dishes in the sink. I'll keep her in my room, I promised. Grandio scowled as he thought. Now a scowl. What kind of a look is a scowl? It's kind of like a, uh, I don't know about this kind of look, like a grumpy, maybe he's kind of got a grumpy kind of look on his face. I hooked my fingers into the belt loops of my Mrs. Casey jeans and waited for an answer. What do you think he's going to say? You think he's going to say yes? How could he say no to her? 
Those little rats are nocturnal. It'll keep you awake all night. How about we put her out in the barn or the coop? She'll like the straw, he suggested. Piccolo isn't used to that. She won't bother me at night. We shared a bunk in the trailer. She needs something familiar. She needs me. Now, I wonder if it's Piccolo who needs something familiar or if it's Addie who needs something familiar. Probably a little bit of both, right? Grandio let a few seconds grind by. Saturday then. We'll pick her up. I let my breath go. So what inference can we make there? It doesn't come right out and say that, um, you know, what he decided, but it does say Saturday then we'll pick her up. So the inference we can make is that Grandio has agreed to let um, Addie go get Piccolo. So I'm really excited about that. So we should look at the title of the next chapter before we end for today. Hmm. I don't know what to make of this. So chapter 46, um, which is on page 270, is entitled The Going Away Note. The Going Away Note. So wonder what that means. Be thinking about that before we um, meet up again and hear what happens in chapter 46. And I think, if I remember correctly, how many chapters? 49. So we're almost at the end. We're going to see how things turn out for Addie. All right, guys. Have a great rest of the day. Talk to you soon.